Okay. I, uh, I'm a reference and instruction librarian at Portland State University. And my first year in this new position, uh, I was fortunate to be mentored by Bob Schroeder. And we talked a lot about effectiveness and working with freshmen, sophomore, transfer students, and international students. And I went into the research and discovered Dr. Melissa Gross, Gross and Dr. Don Lapham's study about the ACE model and was fortunate enough to attend the Georgia International Conference on Information Literacy and get to know them and talk to them and be in their session. From there, I brought that model back to Portland State and created a lesson plan based on the ACE model. Because as Bob will, if you all know Bob Schroeder, he talks a lot about library anxiety and research anxiety and building a, a big avenue for exploration for those freshman international students and sophomore transfer students. And Constance Mellon talked about it and, and talked about having the warm session. And this is my depi depiction of library anxiety, street art in San Francisco. <laughs> Notice the locked door there. So uh, I'm not used to I'm controlling, not controlling my own slides. So <laughs> my anxiety, what works? Well, the warm session, Constance Mellon's the warm session works, and, and Dale Bidmar took that further and tested it and came up with uh, significant findings regarding the warm session. And I think the, res the ACE research model works. And this is the website where you can find the worksheets, the uh, workbook, there's quite a bit of information here, some uh, great bibliographies. I, I, I highly encourage all of you to go to this website, Attaining Information Literacy, and check it out. So they talk about the, the model in this way. This research was designed to address a gap in our understanding of information literacy education by adding student perceptions <laughs> to the question of how to ensure that all students develop the information literacy skills that they need. So the three-year research partnership was um, set up. It was quite an extensive study um, between Florida State University's LIS, Tallahassee CC, and Chukala College, funded by the IMLS grant. They documented the information literacy skills of incoming community college students. They compared their information literacy test scores with student self-assessments of their IL skills. And then from their moment, uh, in depth, they, they conducted in depth interviews and focus groups with these students to explore their own perceptions and what they felt that they needed. So, quite an interesting study, and, and I encourage you to read that study as well. So, they came up with this model, and here's my handout. And it, it's basically define, analyze, define your topic, refine it, find keywords, descriptors, subject terms, and subject headings and then read in a scholarly encyclopedia to maybe find some more language in your discipline. And then search, where do you search? You search for books, videos, websites. What databases are you using for your search? Are you looking for books, websites? I'm being repetitive here, but list it, list them and write them down. And then evaluate, evaluate your resources. Are they current, reliable, authoritative, pertinent? That's that crap model. <laughs> and is it a primary or secondary resource? Is it scholarly or peer reviewed? And then what happens then? It goes right back to analyze, and you can look at that record and find more descriptors and subject headings, the controlled vocabulary of your research. And, and so it's, it takes the students into a circular pattern rather than a linear one, thereby they find out that research is a never ending process. Isn't that glorious? So, <laughs> anyway, I think this works. And I, I, I'm only anecdotal, and I've worked with a few professors at Portland State to see if it works. And I've had great success with it. I'd like to take it further and, and perhaps develop another study. So, I have the handouts, I have this one, I take them into Oxford Reference Online. and and draw on that, and then I have them draw maps, mental maps, and then I have the handout which takes them into the databases. And here's the libguide that I've developed based on this model. Uh, so I've taught from this uh, guide, and then of course students have access to it throughout the term. So from here, uh, here's the bibliography. Constance Mellon, seminal work, great, uh, great scholar, I highly recommend reading her. And then Dale Midmore, of course, Effective Change. Uh, he, he did find significant findings that found that the precession does work. So only connect EM4, so I have to bring in the literature somehow. And uh, that's the epigraph from Howard's End. And that's my information if you'd like to chat about this in some future thing. <laughs>
Good morning. Uh, my name is Christine Tawatau. I'm a uh, librarian at the University of Washington, um, and I'm in charge of the library's web presence. Um, and part of our web presence now has extended into Facebook and Twitter, and I just want to share um, what we're doing and what we've learned from being on these channels so far. Um, there's a pretty active um, Facebook um, presence at the University of Washington, and I feel like we're able to tap into that, and that's why we're, we're being pretty successful so far. We started out um, just by doing the normal stuff, sort of pushing information about um, what's available, our tutorials, hints about printing, um, being supportive of the community. Um, but it's, it's really transforming into just being about community. And as somebody said yesterday, um, showing that the library is a living thing and that we're not just about stuff. And this is a photo of our debate watch that we held um, uh, the past couple of weeks. Um, we are celebrating um, the big things that happen in our libraries, like the renovation of our undergraduate library this year, and um, a shout out to our student employees. It's also been really useful for um, when, when we have power outages on campus, which we've had a lot of this past year for some reason. Fire drills, it's, it's, it's the, the only way that we're able to sort of tell people what's going on on campus. And then, of course, this past year at the UW, we celebrated our 150th anniversary, and that was really a, a great opportunity to show how the libraries is part of the University of Washington and what we've co uh, contributed to the history. Um, we've also celebrated some pretty big milestones in the libraries, including a 10th anniversary of our online chat service, and our undergraduate library celebrated its 40th anniversary, and they had a photo booth on campus, and we posted photos of that. And then there's like the fun stuff, like the photos from our archive collection with the woman in the giant uh, frying pan. Um, but sharing, sharing stuff, like our, our new spaces that we're transforming. Um, the thing that I find exciting, um, one of my colleagues has started to eavesdrop on Twitter. Um, and doing searches, and when people talk about our libraries, we're actually able to respond to their questions when they're having problems. Um, and people actually do ask us questions directly. Um, am I allowed to come to this event? Um, can you give me more information about, about this thing? Which is exciting, they're finding us on these social networks, and, and we're able to answer questions. Um, the thing that people respond to the most, I think, is sort of the inside look into the libraries. And so we've been posting pictures of like old pamphlets that we find. People are we're leaving like origami in the library when we took photos. Um, we have a lot of people contributing to the work that we're doing. We're all sort of volunteering to do this because we think it's fun and we're on these, these networks. And so um, we have people who are doing it for the libraries and then also for their liaison work, which I think is really great. Um, we've, we've started to experiment um, with like asking questions and doing polls through Facebook and actually um, using that information to inform some of the decisions that we're making. Um, we've learned that timing does make a difference. So the time of day and also like the time of the quarter when you're pushing out information, um, when they actually need to know about citation formatting. Um, we learned about that early on. Um, the thing that we're trying to do now more is that the Alumni Association and the student life um, presence has a, a pretty big following and we're able to tap into that and they are also able to reciprocate and you know tell people what's going on there. Um, we do um, use tools to help us manage it, like Hootsuite is great for planning things ahead and schedule things ahead of time so you don't always have to be on it every day. Um, the thing that we'd like to try to do more is um, online dialogue, and I think that Seattle Public Library does a really great job of this. They've got a great community, and they ask really open-ended questions, and people respond, and it's just, it's, it's not necessarily informative, but it's really building community, and that's, I think that's the key to, to this thing, and this is what we've learned from doing this the past couple of years, to be constant, to, to, to celebrate the, the things, as well as the big things, as well as the everyday things, um, and, and to, to really just be part of the community. It's not just about pushing information, it's about um, participating and 
like I said, um, tell people that the library is not just about stuff. We're, we're more than that. So thank you. <laughs>
And I think it's really, what we really want to be doing is we want to be talking about the learning narrative within libraries and connecting that with what's important with our, with our other stakeholders and patrons in order to create pathways of success and pathways of communication. And I think the learning narrative is like one, one way that we can begin to start making those connections in a stronger way. All right, get right on. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about a kind of a disorientation uh, that comes from living in the future that I think most of us are old enough to remember as a, a province of science fiction. Um, but I want to suggest that libraries can and should ride some existing trends to capitalize on portability of information sources. Um, portable libraries have a, a precedent, a very ancient one, in the days when you had to carry it around with you because books were so precious and you didn't have very many of them. Um, I see a kind of symmetry here to what we have now. We have this increasingly portable but still expensive object <laughs> that can provide us with access to information. Uh, in a print-based world, you have libraries that are essentially locked in place. They, you, you can't keep this in your possession at all times. Um, but I kind of see this as the data center of times past. Um, it's just that in order to access this data, you have to be in the same place as it because you can't take it with you and you can't access it remotely. And even once you have circulating libraries that are the norm, some of these materials are too expensive or rare or frequently referred to to be let out. Um, so these are things where rarity and expense necessitate going to the location um, to access these materials, archival materials, reference books, current periodicals, werewolves. <laughs> um, what's, what's interesting to me about this, though, is that if you watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer now, it's remarkable how dated the library looks. Um, even after only 20 years, um, there's no computers in it. Giles doesn't like them. Um, there's no students in it, except for Buffy and her friends. Um, and nobody ever checks the books out. Um, but today, we have this hybridized, diversified, multi-channeled library environment where content is uncoupled from place. Um, this is a very different use of library space and one that increasingly supplants rows of bookshelves. Um, my students won't use an encyclopedia that's not online anyway, so I start asking why those books are still there. Uh, the library now is a part of a multitude of information channels of varying levels of quality and convenience, and convenience often trumps quality, as we all know. Um, some of them, like Wikipedia, stand alone in users' awareness, and then others, like PubMed, might be in the library, but they're not of the library. We're providing access to that channel. But inside the library, we have this heterogeneity of sources and formats and access options. And I see one of the points of the library is the ability to access and read and synthesize multiple sources of information coming from all of these different places and different kinds of materials. Um, in order to, to bring, some, bring it all together. Um, what I do see as new is this multiplicity of options for accessing and interacting with that information. We have all of these devices and formats, and some of them are in competition with one another. Some of them won't speak to each other. Um, mm -hmm. Any of you handling downloadable ebook licenses know what I'm talking about here. And then, you know, the days of just calling the reference desk to, to ask for information are, it's again, just one of a multiplicity of options because there's so many different places that you can go for answers and even to get answers from people, um, which, you know, in, in a way is, is, a, is a strength as well because, you know, if somebody called me to ask for the capital of Assyria, I wouldn't know what it was either. <laughs> um, so the big question is, okay, now what? And I want to propose that the library is not one thing. Um, and it's not a permanent thing. The ways that people access and use information are changing too fast for us to really predict in concrete terms what comes next. But I do think there are some trends we can may safely extrapolate from, and one of those is increasing portability. It's already portable. You can already have a device in which you can store information and carry it around, and it's coalescing around these certain kinds of devices, tablets and smartphones. 25% um, and 45% of American adults own tablets and cell phones, respectively. Only 15% of college students own tablets, but 62% of them own smartphones, and a significant percentage of that, they actually do use them for research. We have all of these apps that we can use to read books, access specialized collections, annotate information, and they're getting better all the time. I think we can safely predict that they'll continue to proliferate and improve, 
and that we can hook into that by using and creating apps of our own, um, not just ones that we create, but ones that we can plug into and provide access to as part of our own information channels. Um, I'm also thinking that we can use them to directly link to library content and services, you know, especially native apps tend to be very individually task-based. And all of this expands the library's reach. You can be within the library, you can be in the Heathrow Passenger Lounge, which looks a lot like that information commons, you'll notice. Um, partway up Mount Rev Everest or in outer space, that's actually from 2001. But I thought it was interesting because that movie is from the late 60s and already he was proposing this future that we're starting to head towards now. Okay. 